Everyone knows and understands the Ten Commandments, right? Well, maybe. In this brief video series, we'll explore the Ten Commandments by asking two questions. First, what did each commandment mean when it was first revealed in its original context? How did Moses himself and the people of his time understand their meaning, and how did they apply the commandment in their everyday lives? The second question, given the commandment's original meaning and intent, how should we interpret and apply the commandment today in the 21st century? Let's begin our look at the commandments with a comparison. The Ten Commandments are in many ways like the American Bill of Rights. Really, it's the other way around. In a real way, the Bill of Rights is at the heart of the American legal system. All laws and policies uphold and protect the basic rights spelled out there, or at least they should. And if they don't, they should be reformed or abolished. The Law of Moses, the Jewish law, is known as the Torah, a Hebrew word which means instruction or teaching. The Torah, too, has a Bill of Rights, one which is obviously much older than the American version. The Ten Commandments, also known as the Decalogue, is actually the Bill of Rights at the heart of the Torah. But as we shall see, whereas the American Bill of Rights is expressed in positive terms, every person has a right to life, the Torah expresses those rights in negative terms. Do not kill. Do not deprive another of their right to life. More about this later. When Moses stood in the presence of God on Mount Sinai, he was cutting a covenant with God just as Abraham and Noah had done centuries before. Today we call it the Sinai Covenant. But what is a covenant, or a testament, as it's sometimes called? In the time of Moses, some 1,200 years before the birth of Christ, a covenant was a formal agreement, almost always between two unequal parties. Imagine that the army of the king of Persia conquered the Assyrians. The Assyrians surrender and then the leaders of both groups meet to make arrangements. Of course, the Persians have the upper hand. They are the conquerors. So the covenant would clarify some important issues. Specifically, it would spell out the rights of the victorious Persian king. The covenant might stipulate that, for example, the Persian king has the right to tax the Assyrians, or to draft some of Assyria's young men into the Persian army. The covenant would then go on to specify the rights of the newly conquered people. They might continue to have the right to own their own land, or to continue to worship their own gods and goddesses, for example. When all the details were worked out to the satisfaction of the conquerors, two copies of the covenant would be carved in stone or cast in bronze. Many examples of these ancient covenants still exist in museums around the world. Finally, the covenant would be formally sealed or cut. Leaders of both parties to the covenant would gather, and an animal would be sacrificed. That animal would be cut in half and placed on the ground, and the representatives of each side would proceed through it, as if to symbolically say, If we break this covenant, may what happened to this animal happen to us. Some blood of the animal would be sprinkled on everyone present, and then the meat would be roasted, and all would share a meal. Note that at his last supper, this is precisely what Jesus was doing. He was cutting a new covenant, or testament, but not in the flesh and blood of some animal, in his own flesh and blood. That is why he tells those present to take and eat. So the Torah is a covenant between God and the Hebrews, and the Ten Commandments are the list of rights that are at the heart of it. As we shall see, the first four commandments spell out the rights of the conquering king, God that is, and the rest describe the rights of God's new people, the Hebrews. As we examine the Ten Commandments, keep in mind that there are two versions of the commandments, one found in the book of Exodus and a later edition in the book of Deuteronomy. And be aware that originally, in the time of Moses, the penalty for violating any of these commandments was death death by stoning. The First Commandment I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. You shall not have other gods besides me. You shall not carve idols for yourself in the shape of anything in the sky above, or on the earth below, or in the waters beneath the earth. 
There is an assumption here that other gods do in fact exist, but this commandment makes it clear that the Hebrews have obligations only to the one God who brought them out of Egyptian slavery under the leadership of Moses. This form of polytheism, which allows that while many gods may exist, there is only one God for us, one God who is on our side and with whom we have a relationship, is known as henotheism. Strict monotheism, the belief that there is only one God who exists, will come later in Jewish history. This commandment says that no images of God are to be made and worshipped. The letter of the law is telling us that unlike other gods at that time, the God of the Hebrews may not be represented in artwork as any part of creation, not a snake, not the moon, not a human king. In other words, the awesome mystery of God must be respected. In ancient times, people would build shrines to gods and goddesses and put images of the god or goddess there in the belief that this gave them some kind of magical control over the god. Need rain? Then build a shrine to the rain god, offer sacrifices there, and the rain god will be obligated to do what you ask. Instead of praying, May your will be done, O God, this magical thinking is a matter of O oh God, you owe me, so do my will. No images means acknowledging that we have no control over God at all. God has a right to have this infinite freedom acknowledged and honored. God is beyond human imagining, beyond any of our concepts and representations, and beyond our control. The spirit or intent of this law is clear. Because of everything God has already done, God has earned a right to his people's exclusive allegiance and loyalty, and God's people must never fall into magical thinking, fall into the assumption that somehow God is at our beck and call. Well, what about today? Do people today acknowledge and respect the awesomeness of God? Or do we throw the word God around like the name Mary or Sam, assuming we know who and what God truly is? Do we assume that our God should and must do things our way and grant our every wish? Or do we sincerely pray, Lord, may your will be done, in the belief that God knows best and does what is truly in our benefit? Do we trust God? Secondly, do those of us who say we believe in God give him our exclusive allegiance? Do we place our trust in God above all else? Do we engage in magical thinking and practice superstitious rituals? Whatever is at the center of one's life, whatever is the most important and highest good in one's life, that is her or his God. Do we perhaps unwittingly worship false gods? Idolatry means giving our allegiance and loyalty to something that is not God, making idols out of goals such as the pursuit of wealth, or fame, or popularity, or winning, or we give some ism the allegiance only God deserves, for any ism can become an idol. As examples, socialism, capitalism, libertarianism, individualism, and nationalism come to mind. Note that the Holy Book of Islam, the Quran, teaches the very same thing. Do not associate another deity with God. Know therefore that there is no God but God. No visions can encompass him but he encompasses all visions. My God, make this a peaceful land and protect me and my children from worshipping idols. Worship no God but me. I, the Lord, have an exclusive right to your loyalty and allegiance. The Second Commandment You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. From biblical times to the present day, Jews are forbidden to speak the sacred identity of God first given to Moses. When Moses encountered God in the burning bush, he asked the God speaking to him to identify himself. More magical thinking. Knowing the name of a God gives one power over that God. When the God of the burning bush finally speaks, however, God identifies himself as Yahweh, a Hebrew word meaning I am or I am who I am. This is not really a name, and it tells Moses that he will have no power over God. 
Notice that even that self-description God gives Moses is sacred and is not to be spoken aloud. There are a number of ways of referring to God without using the sacred label Yahweh. One way is to use the title Adonai, the Hebrew word which means Lord. When it appears in English translations with lowercase letters, Lord simply means Master. But when spelled in all capital letters, it is substituting for the sacred word Yahweh. A second circumlocution for the word Yahweh is known as the divine passive verb. Instead of saying God created the universe, a passive verb is used. So instead of saying Yahweh created the universe, one says the universe was created and it is understood that the subject of the verb create is God. Likewise, Jesus was raised on the third day means Yahweh raised Jesus on the third day. This commandment forbids misusing God's holy name by making false oaths, by swearing to God falsely, and it also forbids cursing, that is, using God's name to place a curse on another, a common practice in the ancient world. If I were to say and literally mean, God damn Larry, I am assuming I can tell God what to do. This is another example of magical thinking which always puts God's independence at risk. God does not obey human beings. Again, God has a right to have us acknowledge and honor his freedom. There are many ways to take God's name in vain today. Probably the most obvious is taking an oath to tell the truth and then committing perjury, lying under oath. But God's name is dishonored in other ways as well, by some politicians who appeal to religion for selfish reasons, by terrorists who use God and religion to justify their murderous behavior, by some dishonest evangelists and other churchmen who use God and religion to enrich themselves. The Koran teaches something quite similar. Do not use God's name in your oath as an excuse to prevent you from dealing justly. Glorify the name of your Lord morning and evening. Do not misuse or abuse my holy name, for I the Lord have a right to have my freedom acknowledged and honored, and my name treated with dignity and respect.